Institute was um, uh, has, has signed an MOU with the Delhi Development Authority to prepare the next master plan for Delhi, which is for the perspective of 2041, which has uh, sort of given us an opportunity to dive deep into what might be the malaise that might be leading to some of the manifestations in terms of poor air quality and other kinds of resource management issues. And the other is that uh, I serve on the board of an organization called Clean Air Asia, which is uh, headquartered out of Manila, but also does an annual conference called Better Air Quality, uh, a global uh, event. And I have learned over the last one year of being a trustee on the organization about simply the kind of complexity that uh, uh, Pallavi has, has described in such uh, wonderfully sort of evocative and uh, you know uh, very uh, uh, clear uh, kinds of terms. Um, so uh, I'll try and sort of reflect a little bit, and I, I will not try and share more information. I think uh, the previous speakers have given a lot of information. Um, I'll try and just shed some lights on what I think are critical elements of how we can respond to this situation. Clearly, there is a crisis. Um, I find it uh, completely, s I, I find it surprising that we, that we actually managed to uh, uh, not, not raise a bigger hue and cry about the fact that we have uh, toxic air in our cities, and clearly uh, that steps can be taken. Uh, we can learn from China. We can learn from other. Uh, you know, I, I go to the Philippines to, uh, you know, to attend board meetings. There are mayors in the Philippines who have taken more decisive actions uh, about air quality in Philippine cities than uh, we seem to be able to do. Uh, you know, at much higher levels. So uh, it, it seems really peculiar that that we are not able to respond better to this. But I th I think there are some structural issues why we are not able to do that. Um, one very big issue which both uh, Dr. Aliwalia and Pallavi have talked about is this whole problem of information. We are simply not informed enough. Pallavi said very well, awareness is not enough, but it is a prerequisite. It's a prerequisite. And Dr. Aliwalia also mentioned in the making of the HPEC report how basically the entire urban sector, which uh, in a sense now controls pretty much a lot of our economic uh, development as well as our daily lives, uh, is so... Uh, uh, um, uh, it, it's so deprived of information and data that on the basis of which decisions can be taken. And we are only just beginning to foray into uh, evidence-based decision-making on uh, urbanization. So this may not be apparent to all of our citizens. And I think it's really important that uh, all of us become highly aware of the fact that not only are we planning our cities with very little information, not even close to the kind of scientific rigor we expect of somebody to uh, you know, use in a laboratory with a mouse. We are, we are subjecting ourselves to development processes in which we are not even measuring how those affect us or even how those are, are, are engendered in some sense. So uh, we must be conscious of this because this really will be the beginnings of whatever kind of response we make as a collective because this requires collective and differentiated uh, and, and sort of multi-stakeholder kinds of actions. So data is important. We've made some uh, uh, moves in this, but we need to do a lot more. Um, the, other, uh, the other really important thing, and, and Mr. Chandra mentioned it uh, uh, towards the end of his uh, presentation, poor planning. He said poor planning, but I, I would just say planning in itself. Most of us do not get involved in the very very important and, in a sense, uh, deterministic process of urban planning. Um, and, and we are not aware of the fact that there are decisions taken by planners that ultimately create the outcomes that we suffer. So lack of clean air is the outcome of many different decisions that, uh, and, and poor decisions in many cases, that result in that lack of poor air quality. So, um, you know, unless we are more involved and more informed about that process of planning that creates these outcomes, we are simply not going to uh, be able to battle this. Got to decentralize all of this. Um, however much we may talk about air quality at the macro level, the city level, um, we've got to understand that that data, that measuring of air quality has to be ubiquitous. We've got to be able to do it at the level of our own neighborhoods and thereby be able to have a much more granular, uh, granular idea about the sources of that air pollution in our very neighborhoods to start with. Uh, and there are cities in the world, I mean, one, one classic case is the city of Bilbao in, uh, in 
Basque province of Spain, where there are community level data observatories. And those community level data observatories where the community maintains the data on its own performance, its own destiny, you might say. Um, and that's linked to the city data observatories. It's agglomerated at the city level. So communities are measuring themselves, measuring their own environments, uh, uh, being able to identify and articulate problems better. And the city is uh, also looking at the same data. And, and therefore, decision making and discourse is informed, completely informed. It's no longer about ideology necessarily. It's not about uh, tendentious arguments. It's about the facts of uh, the measured facts of the environment. So clearly we need to get into community level engagement. And all of us, you know, in terms of RWAs or wards or whatever might be those subsets that uh, have a geography, we need to begin to activate those. Um, the fourth aspect, which is now also related both to the community as well as the planning is, and Mr. Chandra again mentioned uh, public transportation. Uh, I want to just add a dimension to that. Um, Public transport in most uh, planning uh, uh, thinking today uh, is, in a sense, the lifeblood of a city. Uh, uh, it, no progressive, livable uh, city in the world, or even a productive, or uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a city that produces high levels of wealth, um, no city like that is able to do it without really strong backbone of public transport. So clearly, we need more public transport, but we are going to get a lot of public transport, and yet we are not going to necessarily have the efficiency we need. Uh, the metro in phase three and phase four is going to give us a huge network of uh, public transport. And yet the buses that ought to take us to our homes, that last mile that connects us to the workplace, or the footpath that allows us to walk to our workplace or walk from home to the metro station doesn't exist. So it's not enough for us to build public transport networks, but that has to be integrated into the very planning uh, of the city. And really, at a very uh, neighborhood level, that planning has to be done. Now, um, this kind of transport systems are very complex. They are multimodal, as they are called. They are, they are rail-based, plus buses, plus we have to take into account cars, two-wheelers, walking, cycling. All of this has to be planned very well. And this requires capacity. And, I'd, and Dr. Aluwalia mentioned capacity, and I really do want to sort of end my intervention on highlighting just how much of a crisis this capacity crisis is. Um, we, um, you know, numbers don't suffice <laughs> to make this argument. It's, let's put it this way, there are cities in the country where um, somebody who is hired as a gardener might be running the local bus system or somebody who is hired to manage the water system might also be running the schools. It's, it's somewhat surreal. Uh, the, the lack of capacity in our cities to actually deal with this mounting problem of urbanization and all the crises related to it uh, is such that the public should, uh, would, would be, uh, I think, well served if they're more aware of this. Uh, there is an expectation that cities can, can sort of, city governments can fix it. Uh, Dr. Aluwali has written about the capacity constraints, uh, uh, you know, and I, I think this is necessarily a part uh, or, or a necessary part of any conversation on fixing things in our cities, which is that we actually don't ha have enough uh, people on the ground who can fix things at every single point where these crises are born. Um, so how do we augment our capacities? This brings us back to participation of communities and participation of institutions and organizations in, in, in the city. So uh, this uh, kind of uh, multi-dimensional, multi-stakeholder response that has led to any solution of the air quality problem is something that is actually the, one might even say the panacea. That, that is what will take us towards some level of uh, control on the destiny of our, of our city <coughs> and therefore